Maria Paula Martinez. Don't forget, please, Paula, to unmute yourself. Sure. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I, I, I'm, thank you for inviting me to this meeting today. I feel very, very honored to be here. And I feel like so like surprised and so happy to see so many people from all over the world. I'm like very moved. This is so nice. Like we're connecting one Saturday morning, all of us together. It's very beautiful. So I say good morning, good afternoon, good night, maybe to everybody. Um, it's really, really, really nice to be here. Well, I'm, I'm gonna share my screen so I can share you, uh, be sharing my presentation to you. And um, as uh, Ricardo and Paul very nicely said about me, um, I'm a Mexican documentary photographer. I'm based in Mexico City. And um, well, I studied a long time ago, uh, French literature in the university. And I was working for a very long time, <clears throat> sorry, in the, Mexican, in the Mexican government, in the cultural places. Then I worked in the Argentinian embassy. Um, and then, but I was very unhappy because I was, I, I wanted all the time to go exploring, but I couldn't, since I was a little girl, every time my mother was looking for me, it was, where is Maria Paula? And she had to look up on every tree to see where I was hanging. And uh, so this spirit kept on me. And after uh, my mother, uh, she was, she got sick. She, uh, she got cancer. And at the same time, my father's wife, so my brother's mother had cancer too. So there were like five years of chemotherapies, hospitals, operations, surgeries. It was like, uh, a big like dark period in my life <clears throat> and then my mother died and after that my father's wife died and you know I was so confused I was so like depressed and unhappy <clears throat> and one day my father told me you should buy a camera you take really nice pictures on Instagram I told him, of course not, I'm not gonna buy a camera. I don't have a job, I don't have money. How am I gonna buy a camera? So he took me to the sale of the sale of the sale of the sale. And I bought my first camera. And when I got it in my hands, <clears throat> I said like, oh my God, what's this? You know, all the bottoms, the ISO, the shutter speed. I was like, what's this? And so I took a little workshop in Mexico City that was named Digital One. And it was just to know how to use the camera. And after three months that I finished it, the teacher told me, you have to keep studying. I'm gonna give you a scholarship in this school. And I said, wow, really? And she said to me, yes, yes, you have, you have to keep doing this. And so she gave me a scholarship and I went from scholarship to scholarship to scholarship, and I did all the courses in the, in the school photography. And then I arrived to photojournalism. And I had also the fortune that I got a scholarship and I went to study photojournalism to Paris and London. And then uh, I was very amateur photographer. Um, I found photographers without borders. Photographers Without Borders is an association that is based in Toronto, Canada, but they have a web of photographers around the world and they do humanitarian work, like documenting works around the world. And I took a workshop with them in India. And it, it was my first trip, like going uh, away, like, to, to learn photography. And there was the director of Photographers Without Borders there. And we went to, um, to work with an NGO that uh, helps uh, women, uh, to empower women in such a patriarchal society as the one in India, um, where like, 
it, it's it's very hard for women. They they are like almost made to get married and have kids and take care of the of the parents of of her husbands. And in many little towns in India, uh, we were in Rajasthan, and it was impressive because um, I, I was so impressed of all the colors in India, the people. Uh, everybody was so nice. I was working like a lot with with women and girls in in this place in India. They teach them how to sew, and they give them a sewing machine at the end so they can work with that. Here, as you can see, women that are gonna get married, they have to to cover their faces so nobody sees them. And they were. It was very nice to see how they were like getting all together to work and to help each other uh, to they, they invited us to their homes um, and, and it was very impressive. He, here they were dancing and singing feminist uh, songs and like helping themselves uh, the, to each other. And it was very impressive for me because I sent the photos to Mexico City and suddenly I found a person who sponsored uh, six years of school for five girls. So suddenly I said like, oh my God, this is so powerful what I have in my hands. This camera is like so powerful. I, I can help people around the world because what does photography is to connect the heart of somebody in, like, in India that maybe needs some help for something to somebody in Mexico who says, oh, I wanna help. And so um, I could help those girls and I was surprised. Here, for example, this uh, lady, she has her sewing machine and in the back she has a little store where she sells candies and cookies and everything that started because she started going to those places to learn something. It was very funny because in this NGO, there was a girl, Monica was her name, and I asked her, and what did your father say at the beginning when you were like going to work? And she said, uh, well, he was like very angry. That how was I working? But suddenly I started bringing money to the house. So he was quite happy. And like that, she started working. Uh, for example, here she bought her cow and, and she could like make milk and things to sell. And it was a very big progress for her. And so here in India, for me, my experience, it, it was like my first approaching to photography. And I was very surprised of, of this, of the power of an image. So after I went uh, with uh, Photographers Without Borders, they sent me to my first assignment by myself. And I went to Malawi. I went to work with an NGO that is named Drug Fight Malawi. And they go to the very, very poor villages and help people get outside, get, get out of alcoholism and drug addiction. Um, and uh, it, it was here. I, I really was in the heart of Africa. It was ver very nice. I, I don't know what about nowadays, but uh, on that time, Malawi was the third poorest country in the world. So I'm, uh, I was there and I was living like in the villages with the people. They were teaching me how they do everything. And it was very funny because the first day I arrived to the village, all the kids looked at me like they were surprised and they ran away. They were so scared of me. And I said like, oh my God, what did I do? And they told me, don't worry they have never seen a, a white person in a, a white person in front of them. Fortunately, they were kids and like less than one hour later, I had all hanging on, on me and we, we were together. But it was very surprising. There were very, very far away villages, like remote villages. And I could be with, a, with the mothers of the village that they were having a very, very, very hard time taking care of their, of their babies in such a poor environment with a lot of uh, sickness. 
and they were like in a lot of 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 needs and look some of them were so young and all already had uh, babies and so i felt felt like very connected to those to those women um they were super 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 nice and and so for example Sorry, Maria, you oh. have yeah, something happened. Sorry. It's okay. <laughs> I'm I'm um, un unmuted now. Yes, you can hear me. Yes, we can. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Uh, I was invited to go to a chief crownment ceremony in the village, and I think I would have never been able to get in places like this to see th those ceremonies that they were something I had never seen before in my life. If I hadn't been going with the people from the NGO that this was their villages and they took me, they, they, they were so nice at me, they, they took me here. And it's also, they told me, we had never allowed a white person to get in this ceremony, but we're gonna allow you to get in, you're invited. And I was so nervous at the beginning because I, everybody was looking at me like, what is this person doing here? But fortunately also, there was happening so much things around that everybody forgot me and I forgot everybody very fast. <laughs> and uh, here in Malawi, um, I, it was winter. I, I'm a mountaineer, I'm gonna talk about that in a little bit. And I had like all my mountain clothes, jackets, boots, everything on and the little kids were the, with the clothes they were all broken and with no shoes some of them and so uh, i said like oh my god I, I would like to help them and i did a little campaign in on instagram and i put their photos and i could uh, get two thousand dollars in one week i know that's not gonna solve the poverty problem but I said, well, at least they can have shoes or blankets for the winter. And once again, I was so surprised of the power of photography. I said like, oh my God, this is like super powerful because once again, I think what photography does is to, to unite hearts all around the world, like us today, this morning, that it's so fantastic. And, um, and, and I was very, very surprised of, of this. Here I am working uh, in the villages. Look at me, how I was dressed. It was really cold. And look at the kids. They were like almost with nothing. And he here we are, we made a movie with the kids. And here the photo in the right, it's because I want to share with you that one of the most amazing things that has happened to me around the world is that people feed me. Anywhere I go, people sit me in their tables or in the floor if there is no table, it's okay. And they feed me and they give me whatever they're eating. In Africa, for example, rice is too expensive. So they make um, like something with a flour and hot water. And with that, you eat whatever you have. And here, um, the two guys who were cleaning my the whole uh, the bed and breakfast where I was staying in Malawi they told me we want to invite you to have dinner in the white house I said well, the white house and they were living in a little house painted on white so I went to have dinner with them and they bought chicken that they never do and they made a, a dinner for me and we ate together here we are <laughs> we ate together and they were so nice at me like People are nice, people are nice. And, and they have treated me so well around the world. Um, here we were having a dinner. Uh, and then I went to Mongolia with Photographers Without Borders to document uh, the life of the nomadic families and to see what are their needs. I was so surprised of Mongolia. It's a so vast country and it's like, between three and four million people in all the country. In Mexico City, we are, uh, I think we're 30 million people in Mexico City. So I was so surprised to see this in Mongolia. 
And here we were following the nomadic traces and we were traveling with the nomadic families that they're always moving because of the weather. Mongolia gets like really, really cold weather. Well, maybe some of you get really cold weather too. Uh, here in Mexico, we don't get very cold. And so they live, look at this, it's so vast, uh, the, the landscape, and they live in those little uh, houses. And people are also, they are so nice. They were like receiving us in their homes. Uh, and, and well, we were like the, the kids that are always um, so, so nice uh, people. They're always intrigued and they are always so friendly. Um, here we were with them. He, he, he was a farmer and he was all the time with his little, with his little daughter that was with him all around everywhere. And here, this photo is also to show that they were so grateful at us that they killed a goat. They cleaned it in the per perfectly way. There was like no drop of blood going out of the goat. And then uh, the wife, she cooked it for us in a soup. And for them, it was really, really, you know, really hard to, to, to give us a goat as a present. Uh, and so it was like a, such a nice detail from them. Uh, and you know, this, um, this guy, we were taking some photos with a white horse, a wild horse that just came. And this guy, he was really drunk with a, they made in, in Mongolia, they make their own gin. And so those bottles on the back of the motorbike are with gin and he came really drunk. He got down from the model. He stood there and he said, photo. And when we, we took a photo of him, he went back to his motorbike. And when he was leaving, I took this photo and, and it was a character that suddenly appeared. I don't know from where, but it was like so nice to, to see him arriving like that. And this is the white horse we were taking photos with. Uh, and it was really nice because suddenly we went out from the, from the little house and there were like wild horses uh, running around. Mongolia is a beautiful place. If you can go one day, maybe rent a motorbike or something, it's very, very nice. And here is like the stars and the Milky Way with where we were staying. And um, my next project with Photographers Without Borders was Ukraine. This was a very hard project for me because I was in Africa. Uh, Africa, maybe it was very poor. But you know, in Africa, they dress in colors, they dance, they make ceremonies. It's a little bit more like in Mexico. <laughs> but Ukraine, Eastern Europe was for me was very hard. Like I went to work with the LGBTQI community and their families because people from the LGBT community in Ukraine, they don't have rights. They don't let them study, go to universities, get jobs. And they also discriminate their families, uh, their mothers. Um, sometimes they're like, they, they judge them a lot. And so um, I was with, with those ladies that they're mothers from LGBT people. And it was very hard for me because I don't speak Russian, neither Ukrainian. And when I used to go with them, they were doing things together and they were all the time speaking in Russian. And I was there like, I didn't understand what to do. And a week passed, another week passed and I was like, oh my God, I don't have a story. What am I gonna give back to photographers without borders? How can I do it? And one day I went and I bought a big box of macarons and I brought the macarons to them. And she said to me, can I open it? And I said, yes, of course, they're for you. Well, they were so happy eating the macarons. And so one of them told me, I had never, I don't have a professional photo portrait of me, of myself. Can you take one? I said, sure, of course. And so I took a photo of her. And then I had all the ladies, like they wanted a photo. So I took photo of them. And it was very nice because they started opening themselves with me. And she, for example, she told me, 
um, can my my son lived for five years in Mexico. Would you like to come and have dinner with us? So she invited me to her home and we had dinner together. He cooked really nice food, Thai food, very spicy, but very nice. And uh, then, for example, she told me, I have a transsexual son. Would you like to meet him? And I said like, of course. And so I met him, Fris, it's his name. And he has a um, NGO for trans people in Ukraine that it's so hard for them to, to be facing all the discrimination and everything. And so he invited me with his friends that were super, super nice people. And, and I started like getting along with them. Then I went uh, with many other friends and I could get a story. And she was uh, my translator in Ukraine. She was a very, very nice girl. Uh, Natasha, she also invited me to her house to meet Alice, her bunny. <laughs> and uh, so I, I, I could see her life how she has been facing like, like everything from because of being an LGBT person in Ukraine that is so hard. And here is like, she was such a nice grandmother. She invited me to her house. She gave me food. She didn't speak English. I didn't speak Ukrainian as I told you, but she was reading me things. She was feeding me. And you know, sometimes we don't have to talk to understand each other. Sometimes it's, it doesn't matter if we don't talk the same, uh, the same language. It doesn't matter if we're from uh, Turkey, Italy, Mexico, China, whatever. It's just connecting with a glance. I think it's, it's everything. She was such a nice lady to me. And then I went to Armenia, the closest I've been to Turkey. I know there are many persons from Turkey here. Um, and Armenia was a it's a beautiful country. It's um, one of the oldest countries um, in the world. And I also went to work with women. And I, I had like uh, the big um, uh, genocide commemoration. And I was there uh, filming, uh, taking photos of them. They were all together they are a very uh, christian country and also they were it was a very nice moment that i went to to see this of the commemorating the genocide i don't know how many years it was but here for example she is a lady she opened a secret library in a building so you go and you ring the bell and she lets you in and it's all a library where are books from women philosophers women writers um, and it was like, it, it was really nice what she created. And also here, once again, they invited me for Easter to have dinner in their homes. Uh, people have been always very nice at me. And uh, this is the last project I did uh, for Photographers Without Borders. It was at the end of 2019. And I went to Brazil to the state of Minas Gerais. And I went to work in little towns along this very long highway that you can see in the photo that is named the BR116. Where in those little towns that are very poor towns um, in, in Brazil, it's very common that girls uh, get in prostitution. And so it's like, maybe sometimes there are girls that are like 10 years old, 11, 13 years old. And it's very common that, that they get paid for the, by the truck uh, drivers uh, to sleep with them. So um, I, was, I was there living with those girls in Brazil um, for, for a while. And, and for them, it's very common because sometimes they also learn it at home. Uh, so they started doing uh, some um, like centers where they can go and uh, learn how to dance, theater classes, and, and also to prevent the youngest one to get on these 
terrible uh, path. So here I was working with those girls. I think it, it, this was a very, very uh, tough project. But uh, th they are like kind of um, rebuilding again their identities, like their stolen uh, youth. And uh, I went to their houses to to uh, to to meet their mothers and their families. And some of them, it's very hard because they learn all of this at home. And also, as they bring money uh, at home, um, it's like common for for them to be to be working on this. Mm. So, you know, those are their houses in, in, in Minas Gerais. And sometimes even, for example, the brother is a drug dealer or the same mother is a drug dealer. So they, they're living in a very hard environment. What, they're, what they learn at home, it's something uh, like very, very hard. And, um, and I, was, I was there with them. I'm sorry, hold on. I, I'm so sorry, I have two cats and they're making a mess. Let me take them out. Come on. I am so sorry. <laughs> My cats were making a mess inside the room. That's okay, that's okay, no problems. <laughs> um, and well, here is, um, you know, those, those little girls, she was, for example, eight years old and she used to go to those, uh, to those places to dance and to, to get the classes so they can build another kind of identity and, and, and they can find another place in the world. Here she was with her mother. They were also really, really nice people. And so they go and swim together and they get also together to, to be able to find another way in life. And this is very quick. I'm going to just tell you about this project I, I do in, in Mexico with this open water swimmer. Uh, he is an open water swimmer who he's really crazy. He's 63 years old and he does uh, double crosses of uh, many channels in the world. He did the double cross of Catalina channel in 2019 i went to document it and now in july we're going to england because he's going to cross the english channel uh, a double cross uh, and when i met him it was really nice because he has a, a also a, a, like an ngo and he teaches um kids to swim and here we went to a house of um it's like a I don't know how to say that in English, but like a kind of school where the kids go and stay and they sleep there and they live there. <clears throat> and uh, those kids are kids in Mexico that live in the street. And uh, they they are now in this place. And one once he went to give a conference and one of the kids said, I want when I will be grown, I want to be like you, but I have never been in a swimming pool. And so he said, what? And, and he took them and he made a program where there was a boss going to pick them up, giving some sandals from a box, like you, they, they used to take like whatever sandals they, there were. And after one year, all the kids from that school, they learned how to swim. And so this project was like really nice to see the kids uh, growing and swimming and, and then here, here is a place in Mexico, in Sonora, named Punta Chueca. And the natives <clears throat> that live there are named the Ceris. It's so hard to get to the community of the Ceris. They are very, very close and they usually don't let people to get in. But they're a, a fisherman uh, town. And so the kids get drowned a lot in, in the sea. So he also went, those are the cities, they paint their faces. So they went and they made a swimming uh, class during the summer and they made this uh, um, swimming pool in the sea. And all the kids 
all the kids from this community, they learned how to swim. And it was also a very, very nice project to see all those kids uh, getting confidence and getting in the water. <clears throat> and this project in Bangladesh, I went last year in, in January 2020. The Harvard University called me and they told me they wanted to do a, a project, uh, the architecture department of the Harvard University, <clears throat> a project in the largest refugees camp in the world. This is the, the refugees camp in Bangladesh. More than one million Rohingyas that are ethnical and religious group in Myanmar, they crossed the borders because they wanted to make a genocide of them uh, because of religious and cultural reasons. <clears throat> they are Muslims and in Myanmar they are Buddhist. And so they crossed the borders and they started living in this camp. And so the architecture department of Harvard University wanted to make a communitarian building so they could have uh, something to, to, to have a, a maybe a kind of better life that they're having in the camp. The camp is terrible. They told it smelled like death for one year. So <clears throat> also for the kids that live in the camp, to be able to have a, a space, a different space. Here is the school in the camp. And here, for example, is the kid, uh, they, they made him draw his the house he wanted. And this is the house where he lives. So it's also a very hard life in the camp. I can't imagine how was the pandemic there now. There is a space for women to, uh, so nice women, really, really nice. And to do this project, we were traveling a little bit in Bangladesh to see how people live in Bangladesh. Uh, how are their kitchens? So the people from, the, from architecture, they were going to build something according to their needs and to what they like. Because they say like, yeah, because Western people, they always come and they want to make us cook in their kitchens that are horrible. We don't like their kitchens. We don't like their toilets. We like our own kind of, uh, of, of kitchens and everything. So we were traveling to see how they live. They were such nice ladies all around. Again, they made us eat with them. Um, very beautiful culture. And this, I want to talk to you a little bit about this, uh, one of the last projects I did. I was in Bangladesh in January 2020 when a friend texted me and she told me like, hey, Maria, you have to take care because there is a new virus that is in China and it's like killing a lot of people. And I was like, what? What are you talking about? And I made the biggest mistake ever uh, that I went to Google it. And, and I was like Googling it and I was like, oh my God, this is terrible. Even uh, next day I woke up and I was like uh, coughing. And, and when I came back to Mexico, I went to a um, marine conservation expedition and I had no uh, internet for like 15 days. And when I came back on land, wow, the world had completely changed. You know, everybody was using masks. And in the airport, everybody was super paranoid. And I was like, what's happening? And I came back to Mexico City and my younger brother, he just, he was just, uh, he got his title of doctor in infectious diseases. He was going to get married <clears throat> at the end of May <clears throat> of last year. And I told him, Bernardo, don't even change the wedding for at the end of May, this will be gone. Fortunately, he had a doctor's uh, vision and he changed it for September. Not that good because he had to change it again. Now he said, okay, I'm gonna get married whenever. But I, was, uh, I went to, to La Paz in Mexico, it's uh, Baja California, to spend the pandemic there. Uh, and suddenly, uh, 
the director of Photographers Without Borders, she called me and she said, hey, Maria, what have you been documenting of the pandemic in your country? We are like trying to get um, footage from all, all of our photographers around the world. And I said like, oh my God, I haven't done anything. So I went in La Paz to fly the drone to the empty streets. And three times the police took me back to, to the house. So I said like, okay, this is not the way I can be doing this here. <clears throat> and I presented the project to the hospitals in Mexico City. I was, and they loved it. They told me it's very important to document what is happening in Mexico City. And uh, so I started going to the hospitals to document the pandemic. This is the Latin American Tower. It's in Mexico City. It's a very emblematic uh, building <clears throat> in downtown. And it's very, very tall. And here it has, the, there was this message, quedate en casa, that means stay at home. And it was projected like in the city. And here I started going uh, to the hospitals. I was in 10 hospitals and I was there for eight months. Um, here is like how the nurses, they were getting ready to get inside the COVID area. <clears throat> Here is a hospital that treats people with cancer. And at the beginning, they said, we're not going to be a COVID hospital because we treat just people with cancer. And then they wonder like, OK, but if we don't treat our own patients with cancer and COVID, who's going to treat them? So they open a little area, COVID area. Uh, here is a intubation. The two anesthesiologists are intubating a person um, that was just getting in the hospital, this, the capsule to, to, to take a patient from one side to the other of the hospital. This, for example, is very impressive because in the National Respiratory Illness Institute in Mexico, that was one of the two hospitals that was 100% COVID, the Red Cross gave them these five uh, tents that are named field hospitals. And this is what they use for war or for natural disasters. And they put it in the parking of the hospital to, to be able to get to receive more people. Uh, this is inside of it. And it's what they use for war. <clears throat> we, we were like in a war situation in Mexico. It was like, as in many countries around the world. And with this project, you know, I saw so many things. This was a Dr. Vega. He was uh, doing a video visit to a patient that was intubated. It was very moving because the whole family was singing him his favorite song. And they were saying like, hey, come on, daddy, get well. We're waiting for you. And it, it was very, very, very hard. And it's the only way that people could uh, see their families. Here is a nurse uh, showering a patient with all the cares. Uh, he, here, she is the Doctora Susana Galicia. She is the chief of the rehab rehabilitation department that they get into intensive cares and they start moving the patient so, so they don't get all um, hard. I don't know how to explain that very well, but this is very hard because her husband was also a doctor and he died of COVID uh, like two months ago in the same hospital. So for her, it was also very, very hard. <clears throat> and this, I, I was with this doctor also from rehabilitation. And this photo I wanted to show you because it was a photo that the story behind it is like, for me, it was one of the most impressive in this, in this work. I went with her. And she entered to this room and there was this man that he had a tracheostomy. He was intubated by the throat. And she entered and she said, hello, sir, how are you today? Are you happy? And I immediately thought, oh my God, what's that question? How is he gonna be happy? He's in the hospital, he has COVID, he's intubated. And he said, I'm so happy and grateful to be alive. I was like, Oh my God, me worried because of the most 
stupid things in the world and this man saying i'm happy because i'm alive he taught me like something i, I think he didn't even realize the what he taught me that uh, that that morning and also uh, he was just like with all his companions of the room he was telling them all the time come on let's get better we're gonna get out from this and he got out he, he, he was at home. This is intensive cares in another COVID hospital. And this, for example, is like people were saying, whoa, but when people get inside uh, the, uh, the COVID hospitals, uh, they're alone because the family doesn't go in. I never saw a patient alone. Here, for example, you can see there, are, there were five doctors and nurses around people taking care of them. And this for me was very impressive uh, because it was uh, the autopsia of COVID autopsias that they were taking pieces, for example, of lungs, of heart, of everything to, for the investigation. And those two girls, they were really young and many people had to leave the, the hospital because of uh, they were from the vulnerable uh, people. And so they were all young people inside the hospital and those two girls they were like um they were just um studying and they went and they had to to deal with the with the bodies of the dead people because of covid and it was very impressive how they were uh like disinfecting themselves look she had like two big suits and i don't know how many pairs of glo globes and this is they, they made they created a capsule in the hospital so people could get in and see their death um, family member because they said like for the grief to see the person it's very important and this was a woman saying goodbye to her husband but also as there was a lot of death also life is so important i was invited to document a cesarean section of a mother with covid and this was one of the most uh, moving situation I documented in, in this pandemic because they told me, have you seen, have you ever seen a cesarean section? And I said, no, never. And they told me, okay, if you feel you're going to faint or something, here is a little chair. You can see it. Tell us. I said, like, of course, no, I have seen everything. I'm, I'm not going to faint. And suddenly the baby was born and it started crying. And I started crying with the baby so much. I had never seen somebody uh, born in my life. And it was so beautiful to see, you know, imagine this, this little baby get arriving to the world and seeing all these people with face masks and filters and everything. And, you know, it was like life saying, I don't care about your virus. I'm going to born and I'm going to live. And it was so impressive. Here is the mother feeding her baby with all the personal equipment. It was such a moving situation to see to see this, you know, this was the little baby just being tested after he was born. Uh, but it, it was like so nice. And well, those are some just portraits of the health workers uh, in the city, how they get in, how they got out from COVID areas. And uh, this is all um, how they how they were working. This is empty Mexico City. Mexico City, as I told you, it's like 30 million people. It's always like that people everywhere. And here, look, it was like completely empty. Um, this is me getting in the COVID areas. <laughs> uh, sometimes I also had to put my camera in a plastic bag. Uh, this is also uh, when I was going out. This is the first time I went out. I was feeling like my eyes were going to explode. I, I was with no air. And this I wanted to show you. I finished this project by publishing a book. Uh, this is the, the one that is in the photo is in Spanish, but this is in English. And in this book, I made uh, many interviews of all the health workers, nurses, doctors, and this is, um, uh, how can I say, this is to, to thank them 
the the book is on sale and 50 percent of the earnings are going to be donated to the hospitals to attend the pandemic maybe it's not going to be too much but it's, it's something and it was my way to say thank you to them so i just published this book it was published at the end of february my first book covid book um and here, I'm, I'm sorry, it, it took so long. <laughs> it was this introduction to tell, to say how I've been doing storytelling, telling the stories of people around the world. Uh, and this uh, is my personal project that I've been doing for maybe four or five years. Uh, I'm my, my passion in life are the volcanoes and also the sea. And I, I always like to close with this part because after everything I show you, it's very hard, all the projects I've done, they're very tough uh, topics. But I, what I wanna tell now is that we still live in a beautiful world. And there are many, many, many beautiful places in this world and there are many things to save in this world and to work for. Those are two volcanoes in Mexico City. This is named Popocatépetl and this is named Iztaccíhuatl. Iztaccíhuatl, as you can see, it has the shape of a sleeping woman. So it's the sleeping woman in Mexico. And this is Popocatépetl from Iztaccíhuatl. Popocatépetl is 5,500 meters above sea level is to see what 5,300 meters above sea level. This is the crater of Popocatépetl, is an active volcano. And as you know, Mexico is a volcanic territory. So we have so many volcanoes. Um, this is a Popocatépetl uh, doing a little explosion. This is from, uh, th this, this was taken with a drone. And this is from ground level. This happens almost every day. Uh, this was a, a very big explosion that had. Um, this is Iztaccíhuatl. This is the mountain I was yesterday because in Mexico, we have five, uh, three glaciers and one is the chest of the sleeping woman Another one is in the stomach and another one is in another volcano. And I'm doing now a project, a very sad project, but we are putting on Wednesday, we're doing a ceremony on top of this mountain to put a commemoration uh, sign that says that this glacier is dead. Very sadly, but this one, the one you see, the second one is dead. So we're, we're working on that project right now. Here it's me on the top of here, here, this glacier, the chest of the sleeping woman. Here it's me yesterday. I just put this photo to show you. Um, I was at 5,000 meters above sea level yesterday uh, in the little glacier that remains. This is a Pico de Orizaba. This is a 5,700 meters above sea level. And this is the other glacier that is left in Mexico and it's also disappearing. Um, and well, my love for the mountains have uh, brought me to climb a lot of mountains. Uh, everywhere I go, I try to climb what, what there is. I couldn't climb Mount Ararat, but I really have to go to climb it soon. <laughs> uh, but here is Kilimanjaro the highest volcano in Africa, well, the, the highest volcano mountain or whatever in Africa. And uh, I had the fortune to be there. Look at the glaciers. And I'm, I'm showing this to you because it's so beautiful, you know, and, and those glaciers are also melting. So um, here I was like freezing. I didn't want to go anymore to the submit. I was like, no, I want to go back. And my guide was like, no, let's go, let's go. And I just arrived to the submit uh, of this, uh, of Kilimanjaro. And this is in the, in Argentina. I know we have people from Argentina here. Uh, this is in uh, Ushuaia, the end of the world. 
um, I went in winter and I was doing a project on the mountains there. Uh, so beautiful places also. Argentina is a beautiful country. My mother was from Argentina and uh, it has so many things. It has the glaciers, the falls, um, and the food is also very good. Um, this is Ushuaia. This is like the end of the world is called. And um, here, for example, we found this dog on top of one of the mountains. It came down with us, but it was there. Um, and you know, like um, this um, is a volcano that is emerging from the sea in Mexico in a place named Revilla Gijedo. It's a, like a scuba diving center, uh, very, very important, uh, one of the most beautiful diving sites in the world. And this for me was like, I love the ocean and I love the volcanoes because volcanoes for me, for example, the, the craters are like the mouth of the earth and they connect directly to the heart of the planet. So this is Revilla Gijedo, the Barcena volcano. And this is like starting exploring the depths. Uh, so here is a cenote in Mexico that cenotes were those sacred uh, holes in the earth that they can go like hundred and hundred of meters. This is a friend of mine. She was dancing for me in the cenote. This is the, the whale shark we have in Mexico. Uh, that is, look at the size, it's huge. Look at the little person and it just eats a plankton. They're very friendly animals. And here are the giant mantas of the Pacific. Uh, here in this photo, for example, you can see the size of the person and the size of the manta. The mantas are maybe seven meters from fin to fin. So they're like huge and they're so friendly. They love to be on top of scuba divers because of the bubbles, like they tickle their stomach. So they love to, to, to be, they're very, very friendly. As you can see, they come, they, they really come very close to you and they look at you like, what are you? You're like a little strange. And they're very, very friendly animals. And here are the caves of the sleeping sharks also in Mexico that they used to say, they used to believe that sharks don't sleep because they have to be in constant movement. But here in Mexico, they discovered those caves where they look, they're all sleeping together. And it's very, very amazing to see them uh, sleeping like that. This is in Revilla, another friend of mine. Uh, and this, I made also a big project for the conservation of the great white sharks. Uh, in Mexico, we have, a, in the north of the country, we have a big uh, island that is named Guadalupe and hundreds of sharks come every day to eat sea lions, elephant lion, uh, elephant, uh, oh, I don't know how to say that in English, I'm sorry. <laughs> but sea lions and all these animals, they come every year to feed themselves. And uh, here are the great white sharks that are amazing animals, huge. And uh, this, this shooting, I was uh, taking photos of this free diver and suddenly I open it in my computer. I didn't see it in the moment, but when I open it in my computer, I don't know if you can see it, but there was a shark here. And suddenly in many other photos, there were sharks appearing. I, I suddenly realized we were surrounded by sharks and we never knew it. <laughs> and uh, well, those are things I do underwater. Uh, this was for a, a music video clip. And here I am in the cage taking photos of the great white sharks. Here I am following, uh, swimming after a shark to take pictures of it in, in the ocean. And well, here I have my, my drone and uh, this photo is to show you, I, I found it the other day, I was having lunch with my father. And this person in the left that has a camera and many lenses hanging from his shoulder and is helping his uh, friends to get in the uh, scuba diving suit. 
is my father. My father studied medicine and he has a, and he is a passionate about photography. So he has now a doctor son, a son that is a doctor and a daughter that is a photographer. I think he put a lot of himself in, in his kids. <laughs> and, and well, with, with this image, I want to close saying that uh, we still live in a very wonderful wor world. It's never late to change. I started uh, studying photography when I was 33 years old. And I did my first assignment when I was 34. Now I'm 30, almost 38. I turned 38 at the end of April. And it's never late to change. It's never late to, to, to make a dream come true. And this photo, I took it in the Serengeti in Africa. And we were staying in a camping where there were no fences. So some days uh, when I used to get out from my tent, there were lions or giraffes or many monkeys around. And so um, one day I went in the night out and I saw the Milky Way and I asked the manager of the place, can you turn off all the lights, please? I want to do a long exposure shot. And he said to me like, are you crazy? How are we going to do a long exposure shot with all the lights turned off? We're in the middle of, the, of Africa, you know? And I was like, please, please. And so he sent me to Maasai. They were with me with some big sticks. Uh, I don't know what they were going to do with the sticks if a lion appeared or something like that. But um, we, I was like um, pressing the shutter speed and, and the, the, the button, the clicking button. And it was 30 seconds. I promise they were the 30 longest seconds of my life because uh, it was all dark and suddenly there was something like around and we were like all scared. But look at the photos. It, it was, it, it was, it worth it, no? <laughs> and well, so I think this is just uh, to say that we're still living in a beautiful world and there is a lot to do. Even if we're going through a very difficult time now with the pandemic around the world, Oh, let's let's try to be supportive with each other and comprehensive and let's try to to work this out together people are nice people with me have been nice all over the world and i think we're still in a in a wonderful world and um, this is my website uh maripomartini.net and my Instagram is at Maripo Martini. Uh, I share a lot of things on my Instagram and uh, on my website too. And well, I hope I didn't get you. It wasn't very boring. <laughs> I talk a lot, uh, but well, I hope you en enjoy it. <laughs> Thank Me you. Most.